So this is a continuation of um, my discussion on HG Wells for uh, the A level. Uh, this is uh, notes basically you're going to need in order to discuss it. Uh, for A level you have to compare it with another text um, and it could be um, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood or it could be Kasua Ishiguro's um, Never Let Me Go. Um, or it might be 1984, I can't remember precisely. But anyway, you do actually need to compare uh, the, the, a pre-1900 text, as I recall, with a, um, a 20th century text. So um, what we need to talk about now is the imagery, uh, Wells's use of language and imagery, and then you can probably talk about Margaret Atwood's use of language and imagery or... Um, uh, Isiguro's uh, use of language and imagery. Um, some of you may be listening to this for the OCR, uh, GCSE, and that's really great too. Very, very useful. Get you an A star. Talk about this. So another aspect of Wells' use of language is the number of imagery patterns which run throughout the book and which tend to work on a subliminal level, thus influence the reader subconsciously, rather like the way in which advertising is often meant to work. One of these is the apocalyptic imagery. Apocalypse means the end of the world. Apocalyptic imagery pattern, which consists of references to such things as appear prominently in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is from the Bible, uh, and I think it's in the, the final stages, and it's where the whole of the world ends, basically. Uh, and it ends with fire, smoke, thunder, and storms. Uh, it, effect, it ends in an apocalypse, um, and you have, um, and I think in the apocalypse you might even have um, pandemics, so um, climate change uh, with its pandemic potential, its fire potential, its storm potential looks quite like um, the end of the world in the book of Revelations in the Bible. So anyway, just to scare you, um, that's why I need to tackle climate change. But the effect um, of the apocalyptic imagery in H.G. Wells's book is to generate fear and excitement. Um, We'll have a look at a bit more on this in the context. So when we talk about context, uh, and we'll, we'll also look at it in more detail in the apocalypse section. The apocalypse was a very, very important theme at that point uh, in history in the 1890s uh, because they were coming to the end of a decade, a, a century, and they began to think it might be the end of the world, a bit like what we had when it was the year 2000. Um, and so they had this idea that, you know, something, you know, there's all this, this shooting towards progress. The, the mankind was always progressing, progressing, getting more and more scientific, learning more. And it was only ever up, never in a circular spiral pattern, which nature is. It's circular, it's spiral. It, you know, it create, destroy, create, destroy, or the cycle of life and death. Mankind is sort of this linear idea that we're just going up and up and up, which isn't really possible. Um and so uh, it's not possible to keep going, developing and developing. You have to, it's circular. Life's more circular, isn't it? We live, then we die. So, but this is the book. Uh, so the book of Revelation is all about fire, smoke and thunder. And the, the millennium, they, uh, which is the end of the 1900s, beginning of the 1900s, it was the turn, a fan de siècle, it was called, the end of the century. They thought, you know, amazing things were going to happen, a bit like what happened in the year 2000, which was really annoying. And, uh, lots of people had to go to work on, on, on New Year's Eve because they thought it was it, the world was going to melt down. A second prominent imagery pattern is the frequent comparison which takes place between humans and lower forms of life, such as animals or insects. So he isn't very impressed by humans, dear old H.G. Uh, Wells. And so it, with the, the idea of Darwinism, the, the origins of the species, instead of looking forward and uh, watching us develop, he's looking backwards. So um, this reinforces the impression of Martian evolutionary supremacy and includes references such as they must have bolted blind, uh, as blindly as a flock of sheep, which we've seen, book one, chapter six, page 30, when he's talking about the crowd. I could see that it would have been with me in the river scrambling out of the water through the reeds like little frogs. So again, a very unflattering picture of uh, mankind as frogs. I like to call them ants. Book one, chapter 12, page 65. Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, or, or as we should, the furious unanimity of our ons onslaught in a hurt, disturbed herb of the hive of bees? I'll read that again. Or did they interpret our spurts of fire, the sudden stinging of our shells, our steady investment of their encampment, as we should, the furious unanimity 
of an on of onslaught in a disturbed hive of bees. So when they're trying to, you know, approach the uh, Martians with their little shells and, you know, approaching on their encampment, at uh, their camp, basically, um, are they, do, we, do they look upon us in the same way that we look upon um, a disturbed hive of bees that come and annoy us or a disturbed um, uh, nest of ants? Um, the fury of unanimity is um, basically they're all doing the same thing. They're all collected together to, to fight the human being who has actually uh, gone into their hive, come and sting you. Uh, and that's what they're likening us to bees, stinging the Martian, basically. So he's sort of almost going backwards in the evolutionary uh, spiral, isn't he? So setting about it as methodically as men might smoke out a wasp net, the Martians spread this stifling vapour over the Londonwood country. So this is their, um, their, their chemical warfare, their black smoke. Uh, and they just spread it out over, like we smoke out, we smoke out bees actually, and wasps. Um, to, to get, make them leave the nest, they're actually putting this strange stifling vapour over the Londonwood country. So... Um, they're likening us to wasps, basically. So he's writing at a time a description. Descriptive writing is very, very important. Because uh, why? Because he's writing at a time when the cinema was barely a reality and television was a good half a century away. So world's audience will be well used to creating their own motion pictures within their minds. Providing a writer was skillful, writer was skillful enough to use a su sufficiently vivid description and imagery. The first commercial cinema was Vitascope Hall, which opened on July the 25th, 1896, in New Orleans, America. So the point is, people were getting their entertainment from reading. So by, when they have to read, they have to paint beautiful, detailed pictures as people are reading them. Um, and Charles Dickens does the same thing, and so does Emily Bronte, Charlotte Bronte. Um, anyone who's writing in the uh, 1800s, uh, they usually are painting very, very powerful pictures of language uh, because no one is uh, relying on TV or film, which is why some of the great novels come from that era. True to almost any page, turn to almost any page of the novel, and if you read carefully enough, you'll find Wells' intensely detailed word paintings. I like that. Filling your mind with immensely visual and frequently multi-sensory depictions of the scenes that he firstly vividly experiences in his own imagination. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to paint a picture. Um, when I teach GCSE writing English language, um, I, I actually use the, the idea of the sense description, multi-sensory de de depictions of scenes. That's how good writers write. So, and very visual as well, and, and, and he is obviously a good writer, you're reading 120 years on, so when you're actually writing about him, you need to be aware how he's using, if you actually know about my recipe, you can look it up, he's using my recipe basically, it's in the template, he's using my recipe if you remember, so the night was warm and still, so that's um, sense isn't it uh, and a little oppressive sense description the sound of guns continued sound description intermittently that's now and again and after midnight there seemed to be sheet lightning in the south so that's visual so you've got everything really you've got touch you've got sound you've got visual what's missing taste mm, oppressive almost like taste isn't it okay so book one chapter 14 page 80 He's actually using multi-sensory dep depictions, painting word pictures in our mind. Um, basically because there wasn't the sinner in those days. Also to make it feel re more realistic against that authenticity and realism. And I'm going to stop there. Um, and we'll look at contrast another time.